Hello everyone and thank you for joining us for the second webinar of Effective Workplace Communications, a short course presented by IT Masters on behalf of Charles Sturt University. My name is Guy Coward, IT Masters short course MC. Your mentor is Brenton Birchmore. First, a reminder that we use Zoom for our webinars clearly uh, to encourage, but we do it to encourage questions and the use of chat during the webinar. We ask that you direct all questions relevant to course content to the Q&A section and that you send all administration type questions, sort of important dates, uh, times, uh, resource availability and that sort of stuff to the support team, which is Hannah in chat. You can chat with panelists only or to all of the fellow students listening along uh, to the live webinar. And you can make that choice by toggling through the drop down box um, along the icons at the bottom of the Zoom screen uh, once you've opened up the chat log. We'll have a, a, a fairly long Q&A session at the end of the webinar uh, and um, we'll, we'll have you know, particularly relevant questions sort of at the end of topics and during polls and if anything's super relevant, um, we'll interrupt Brenton. Um, as I said, Hannah's around tonight, uh, helping in an administrative and technical support role. She's also responsible for the learn.itmasters.edu.au website or the course page or the Moodle page, interchangeable terms, which is where you'll find the other materials needed for this course. After Brenton's um, lecture or, or main discussion, um, I'll have a little chat about studying with CSU, what it means, how to get in, um, talking about eligibility for our courses and the subject that this short course specifically speaks to. Um, so if you have any questions about that, check them in. Um, it'll definitely guide what I talk about. Um, and if you have any specific questions, it'll be good to sort of make sure I talk about sensible things. Um, but for now, please, please join me in welcoming Brenton. Um, hope you've all had a lovely week and you too, Brenton. Thanks, Guy. Welcome, everyone. Good evening, good morning, good afternoon. Thanks for tuning in. Welcome back. We're uh, getting into the exciting stuff now, the digital communications digital mediums, digital stuff. And uh, hopefully we're gonna be able to uh, tickle your interest points and cover some of the stuff that you've all been dealing with a little more recently. The poll is great. Thanks everyone for participating in that, those that, that had the chance there. It's good to see that there's plenty of positive engagement, but I think most of us would agree that there's a room to improve. And uh, not only that, but not only for ourselves, but also for all the other people that we have to interact with, right? So what can we learn and what can we do that we might be able to use to help and guide others to do a little better. So hopefully we'll be able to give you some of that info tonight. There may be a few things that I will skip through. I do want to remind everyone that there are also pre-recorded audio uh, lectures, like 15 minute roughly on average, maybe a little less. They are in the learning materials that are online with the course. And I'm not really doubling up on those. There's a few things that, I'll cover in the webinar that are also covered there, but there's a whole extra bunch of information in those that you might not want to miss out on. So let me just close the poll. Did we share the results? Guy, did we share yep, them? They, they were shared. Yep. They were shared. I just yep. kind of click the X right and give it a And, I, and I can only say again, I'm so grateful for those extra audio lectures. The others are the only short courses that do them and they're lovely. Oh, excellent. Excellent. Thanks Guy. All right. So we talked last week about some fundamentals and we talked about the differences uh, between different mentalities, different behaviors, uh, different subconscious elements that influence how we go about communicating. And here we want to talk a little bit about what might be different or of the same when it comes to digital versus direct communications. So in direct communications, I'm talking about the stuff that you know, we're used to doing in person. Does it really change? Well, some things definitely do change and most of them make it more difficult. And that's something we're probably already are aware of. But the way it becomes more difficult is because the process of communicating expands and becomes less subconscious. Our habits are subconscious. So when the medium that we're using to communicate with, when it simplifies and narrows down and has less richness, uh, less elements to it, we as a human being need to compensate for that. So our 
process of communications needs to expand. It needs to broaden and it needs to take a few new and different things into account. We need to behave a little differently. And when we don't, if we try to treat digital communications too much like the way we treat interpersonal direct communications, we won't necessarily have the same success. So we have habits. We talked about them last week. Do they help us or hinder us? Well, sometimes they can help. Sometimes they can make it harder. But the most important thing that I think we need to remember when we're talking about digital communications is that whatever habits we have, whatever we do, whatever behaviors, it's all at a much bigger scale. If we say something to someone in a corridor or in a meeting room or at their desk or somewhere like that, it might be a one-to-one -one interaction, maybe even a faux pas, some little mistake. But if we put that in an instant message that goes to lots of other people, if we put that in an email that goes to many people, anywhere digital, then the impact of that may be significantly higher. So one of the paradigm shifts we need to have is that whatever we do has going to have the potential for significantly higher impact. So this is meant to say to us, well, if we're going to use digital communications, the habits, the simplification of the process means we have to work a little harder at it. And if we don't, the implications, well, they could be a lot more severe if they go wrong. But obviously one of the benefits is that it can also allow us to leverage the upside. We can have a greater impact with our communications digitally and more efficiently than we could have in person. So this is the question, and is it more effective or less effective? Well, it all happens at a bigger scale. It could be good, could be bad, but it's all going to have a greater reach for us. So differences between direct and communications, same human interaction. We have the same inherent mental processes. In fact, one of the things we talked about last week is that when it comes to the written word, when it comes to writing and the use of language, for the period of time that humanity has been developing language, the written word is a small window of the total development of language that we've had. And a lot of the subconscious ways that we use language has come from the fact that it's mostly verbal. So the techniques, the habits, the behaviors that we need for digital communications are extremely recent in comparison. So we can be forgiven perhaps for not totally getting it. But as we said last week, when we have professional communications, we're talking about communications that have a very specific goal, a specific outcome, something that we need it to achieve for us. And it's our responsibility as the communicator. Well, we don't really have a lot of option or really an excuse other than to do that little bit of extra effort and make the digital mediums work for us. Now, in the pre-recorded, there's a discussion about the user experience. Now, the user experience goes far beyond what we're talking about with communications. The user experience is a concept that talks about the way in which any human interacts with any digital medium, any digital experience, digital interaction. And there are principles that we go through. And these are fundamental to the way in which the human mind interacts with something that's digital. And some of these are really quite relevant to us when we're talking about using digital communication tools. When we talk about the UX, everything that happens to a person is part of the user experience. Every nuance, every component, every change, everything that happens to them will influence the vectors of change. It will influence everything that they think and feel and therefore will influence what they do. So the barriers that come up, the obstacles, the challenges, anything that makes it a little bit harder is going to undermine the ability for the message to do its job. In a face-to-face -face communication, the person is the message because they say things and we are reading from that the way in which they say it. We're taking cues from their voice. We're taking cues from their body language. Everything about them means that they are a bigger portion of the message than the actual words they share. In the digital medium, the experience is the message. Everything that impacts that user and that person and that recipient, that is the message. Because we talked last week about the message being a thing. The message is what has 
a license to influence the other person, to impact that recipient and to have them do something, make a decision. So when we talk about a message, everything matters when that message is digital. So all types of interactive media rely on and work with and create a UX. So whether you're talking about a conference call, video call, whether you're talking about an email, website, web chat, instant messaging, anything, all of it, create a UX of some kind. And the commonalities is what we've talked about already. But when there's a problem, those barriers accumulate, they add up. Now, if you're in face to face talking to someone, and you're confused, and you don't quite get what they're saying, you can ask for clarification, you can dig a bit deeper, you can resolve that moment of clarity. And usually the damage done from that can be easily recovered and we move on. In the digital world, there's much more strategic ongoing impact from any barriers to understanding. So the mind, especially the language centers and the communication centers of our brain have to work harder. So any, any tax, any overhead, any loading, any extra burden that the people that we're talking with have to do, have to, have to spend with their communications is going to have a cumulative effect because it's like a tax that builds up over time. So if you've ever had, I'll give you a website example. You've had those moments where you're browsing a website or maybe you're online shopping or you're filling in a form, you're trying to find something and something doesn't look right, something's not intuitive, a button that you clicked didn't work, you can't find the next thing to click, the form doesn't work right, tab didn't do what you thought it would do, and you get some way through the process and you have a feeling of frustration. That frustration is not just because of the last little barrier that you clicked on. That emotional vector, that change that you're going through, is the sum total of everything that's impacted your emotional vector. So when we talk about doing anything digitally, every little piece is gonna add up. And we're talking, of course, about the vectors of change. And we'll, we'll revisit those in a moment because I wanna talk about some of the challenges. And I wanna talk about some of the approaches that we might use in communications at helping overcome the challenges that the vectors of change will encounter. So in a nutshell, everything that goes on during the UX is going to have an impact of whether or not the goal is achieved. And the goal is whether or not the message does its job, whether or not the recipient, the audience of that message is influenced, motivationally influenced in the way that we're hoping that we want, whether or not they will make the decision that we need or want them to make, which is why we made the effort in the first place. It all counts. The good news is, with a bit of thought, effort, the attention to some of these details, we can figure it out. Humans operate with enough predictability that we can define and predict what the user experience might be, or at least the obvious barriers we can aim for and find and isolate. So let's revisit the vectors of change. I'll put them all up, right? So we talked about this last week, the intellectual change the emotional change, the motivational change. Right? We, we talked about it, you know, what does, what does it mean? What does it mean to me? And what will I do about it? Let's look at some of the barriers that come up and how we might bring a different approach. Now, there is no silver bullet to these. This is not a case of, well, when this happens, when A happens, do B. This is an approach that is a way of thinking that will give us a, a starting point as to how we need to align our thoughts when looking for a solution. So if we look at challenges to getting people having their intellectual vector changed, if they struggle to understand something, if they are lacking a context or something they're just not aware of, it's outside of their range of, of awareness, we might need to refer to something else. We might need to educate them intellectually, pass on more information. We might need to get feedback from them to figure out what it is they don't understand. So we might need discussion. These are the kinds of approaches that we might use to tackle these kinds of challenges 
when we're trying to shift their intellectual vector. Similarly, the emotional vector, if someone has a pre-existing attitude, a habit of the way in which they consider things or the way in which they judge things, they've already judged it in some way or they're judging it in a way that's not helpful to where we want them to take their emotions or their hopes and fears are being exaggerated and interrupting their ability to focus on what it is that we're hoping they will think about. We might need to make it more personal. We might need to do more listening. People might have hopes and fears that are getting in the way and they need to express those. They might need to share. They might need to offload some of those thoughts and feelings. If things are appearing to be dramatic, then we might need to help normalize those. Take some of the drama out of the situation. Bring the heat down a little bit so that the tangent that their emotions have gone off in might be less compelling and maybe that their feelings can be more easily influenced by what it is that we want them to consider and what we're sharing. Lastly, the motivational vector. If they have a different intention, if they come into a communication with a different intent or maybe they lack a reason to invest, they don't have a sense of ownership of, of anything that's going on. Maybe we need to take a more encouraging position. We might need to include them in the definition of what this is. We might need to include them in the process of deciding what should happen. Help them see the value, have a value discussion, discuss value, find out what their value is and look for ways to alignment. So these, like I said, aren't simple answers. They are a direction for us to go based on where we think the challenge might be. The big difference with digital mediums is that we often need to think of these in advance. We need to predict where these will come from because we want to engineer a certain outcome. We want to engineer the ultimate decision that the audience and the recipients will make. So by predicting the challenges and then crafting the kinds of messaging that we need with the various approaches that might be helpful is what we will need to do because unless it's interactive, we're not going to get a second chance. And even if it is interactive, if it's digital, our toolkit is much more limited. Now, some of you mentioned, not many, uh, I think it was, as was pointed out uh, by guys, some people said that you know, email is a little more useful for them lately. Huh? Email is something that many, is, many of us have been using for decades. You know, I started using email back in the mid 1990s. I worked for one of the very first internet companies uh, in Australia. And we got excited when people started putting email addresses on business cards. I mean, that, that's how pioneering it was back then. But that was 25 years ago. Today, many of us think, well, it's, it's ubiquitous. We can't live without it. But its role and its functions have been drastically altered and threatened in the last few years in particular because of the way in which other mediums have brought different kinds of functionality that's starting to relegate, not starting to, has well and truly in some cases, relegated email to a different kind of role. Now, sometimes email has been used and, and we do it and I'm, I'm, I, I have done it. I'm sure many of us have done it. We've hidden behind email. Email can be a way of avoiding interacting with something. Email can be a way of saying, well, I've got that in my inbox. I'll look at it later. I'll deal with it later. We have ways of using email to say, look, I've got too many. Can't do them all. I'm going to not do this one. I'm going to not look. I'm going to some reason we have that says, okay, it's only an email. A lot of that is to do with the fact that for many organizations, for many cultures, the expectations of accountability for email are lowering. So had those situations where people send an email and then they follow it up with an instant message or they, they throw a chat at you later. Hey, did you get my email? Did you, if you got an answer, uh, what'd you think? It's because we don't, we can't rely on email. There's too much of it. There's too many things that email expects of us. It is for many people a time sink. Imagine if, I mean, for many of you, just imagine if you responded to every single email you ever got and you responded to it thoroughly and in a timely manner. 
Imagine if that's what you did or, or tried to do just for a week. For many of us, it would be impossible. And then there's that thing of what, that email that you got some time back, not sure when, who was it from? What was it about? It had some document in it. Uh, there was something you said in it. There was a, a code. There was an info something. It's not a very good filing system. And it's not also very good at keeping us organized. And yet, for many of us, it is one of the most common things that we spend our time on during the day. Sometimes we write emails from our perspective. We talked about this a little bit last week when we talked about the star model. We talked about the different perspectives, the different components of a message. We've all been guilty of giving an email rather than sending a message or creating a communications, you know, broadcasting our thoughts, broadcasting something. We've also had the problem where we've said too much in an email. We've, allowed, we've gone around it in circles. We've repeated ourselves. We've said the same thing a couple of times. I, I am guilty of that at times. I over talk stuff and I'm inclined to do that in an email as well. Why? Because I have, high standards with the message. I want it to be received well the first time. Sometimes I am guilty of being a little bit repetitive when I shouldn't be. They're not going to read it twice. All those situations where we send the email a little too quickly. And I don't just mean those emails that are, you know, full of anger that we actually should never have sent. That's a thing. But also those emails where it just came from here, straight to the fingers, straight onto the screen, click send. And maybe it wasn't well considered. Uh, maybe it was even confusing. Maybe it had typos, grammars. Maybe it actually gave a completely wrong idea to someone. Could do more harm than good. It can create more work than it even ever could have saved. And then there's the element of, well, what happens when it's something with an emotional element to it? Something meaningful, something personal, something sensitive. We have found over the last uh, years that what we do on email is something that we need to be very careful of where the limits are. Now, Simon Sinek uh, is a motivational speaker. He's an author. Uh, he writes and, and speaks a lot on helping people empower each other. This is one of his quotes, essentially saying that a five minute phone call will usually save more time than he would have spent on email. The best thing about email was that it was faster than a letter and more convenient than a fax. The most important things about email today are not its benefits. The most important things we tend to talk about when it comes to email are its detriments, its weaknesses, its limitations. They are more often topics of conversation now, things we're more aware of now. And a lot of the time, it's not because email is less than what it was. Email is the same as it always is. In fact, it's many ways, it's more powerful than it used to be. But our use of email as a tool is evolving and needs to evolve because it's just one of the tools that we have available to us. And especially in the last three to four months, a lot of organizations who might have not worried too much about some of the other tools have been forced to employ and deliver a lot of the other tools. Now, here's some things to think about. Uh, when, we, when we get to the email discussion, another slide or so, we'll pause and see if there's any questions about the email topic, and then we'll talk a little bit about instant messaging, et cetera. Things to do with email. Some of this will be obvious. Some of this will be stuff that you'll think, yeah, look, I know it's like that. And some of it will be things, well, yeah, I know it's like that, but I also know I don't quite do it like that, at least not all the time. So follow the rules we talked about last week. Any email is meant to exist only for the result. I have written many emails that I never meant to send. And when I say never meant to send, I delete everything out of the to field because that's the safe option. And I actually know I'm never gonna send this, but I need to write it because I need to formulate my thoughts. I need to get it clear in my head or I need to unload. I need to do something with that process personally. But that doesn't mean I need to send it to anyone. So the star model we talked about last week, consider the recipient, always consider the recipient, follow the three vectors. Email is very good at helping people shift their intellectual vector. It's good at sharing information. It's not very good at helping people have an emotional state. It's tricky. Like all written mediums are tricky at doing that. 
which makes it even harder at the motivational change. And yet, for most of us, one of the main reasons we use email is to try to get an outcome. We want something done at the end of it. Sometimes we need to read carefully, qualify what we've said. The statements, the assumptions that we've made, our credibility once damaged via email is extremely difficult to recover. It takes time to recover. So just a handful of mistakes in terms of credibility are on record. If we then say later, well, you know, we didn't quite mean it like that. An email is evidence that can be thrown back to us. You know, here's what you said. So we always like to think that, you know, we're credible. We do qualify our statements. It's an altruistic goal that we all kind of have to some extent. When it comes to digital mediums, that goes up several notches. Back to what I said in the very beginning. Sometimes we need to address secondary points. Sometimes we need to be aware of tacit knowledge. Sometimes we need to predict what that person is going to come back with and add it underneath. But we have to make sure we don't make it a really long email. We don't want it to be a lengthy discussion that people won't read. We'll talk about that in a moment, how long it should be. But whatever outcome we're looking for, we should start with it and finish with it. The opening statement, the opening sentence, the opening paragraph should normally be, what's this about? And the last sentence statement line should be, and this is what it's about. A direct correlation. It's a circular journey. Show them where you want them to go. Include all the details. Show them where you want them to go. But each email has a job to do and nothing more. I want to talk about threading. Um, Many of you probably would have had the problem where someone has sent you an email and it's got three different things in it. And those three different things, yeah, they, they have connections to each other, but they're also fundamentally different. And what happens is that we might have a question. We might have a reason to reply about one of those three things. So we do. Hey, look, thanks for that. Uh, regarding this, blah, blah, blah. And they write back to us. And then we write back to them and they write back to us. And it's maybe it's healthy. Maybe it's a good discussion and it needed to happen. And that's email doing its job. And we've just completely forgotten about the other two things that were in the email. Or if we haven't forgotten them, they've certainly been deprioritized in our conscious mind. Because what's in our conscious mind is whatever's busiest, the stuff we've been talking about. And this email thread has buried the other parallel points that were original to it. Now, Maybe they were really meant to be there, but maybe they shouldn't be. Maybe three separate emails was a better plan, giving the opportunity for three separate threads of conversation to take place to enable them to still run in parallel to each other, but without diluting each other. That's what threading does. Now, if we're not consciously thinking about threading and creating threads of conversation when we create emails, maybe we're underutilizing what email can and should do. So the important ingredients, let's talk about the subject line. What's the goal of the subject line? Now, I'm sure a lot of people, their quick and easy answer would be the goal of the subject line is to make that person read the email. That's, that's what it is. That's what it means to me. That's my purpose with the email. That's, what, that's it. That's, a lot of people are going to be saying that. You're going to be thinking that. You think that's what it is, right? Well, that might be what it is when it leaves your email. When it arrives at the other end, it has a different job. When the recipient looks at a subject line, its purpose to them is to decide whether or not they will read that email now, first, second, third. Your email is just one of many. They'll use what's in the subject line to prioritize, help them make the decision which email they'll read first, when they'll get to your email, if they'll get to your email. So you might be thinking, well, the subject line is just to make them read it. They're thinking, well, it's not only that, it's when do I read it? So if we are misleading in our subject, if we use it as a sales pitch, if we're a little deceptive, and let's say that that's our approach to subject lines, what's the recipient going to think? They're going to think, well, can't trust Brenton's subject lines. He's trying to sell me on this. The last couple of times I've opened it, it's been misleading. I'll open it later because I can't trust it. I can't trust him. Not sure what to do with it. I'll open 
this other one here because I'm pretty sure that that's really what it's about. So we can help ourselves by having our subject line do the job it needs to do for the person who's actually reading it, which means make it as accurate as we can as to really what's in it. Every email needs to have expectations. This is what it's for. This is what it is. Sometimes that's a separate line. Sometimes that's the starting line. You need to get the point across in the very first paragraph, the first 50 words, the first sentence or two as to what the rest of this email might be about. Because if they don't get it in that first section, there's a, there's a chance that they'll start to tune out. They'll start to skim. They'll do that first last word in the paragraph and they'll be looking for what does this mean to me? What, what is this thing? Do, do I need, really need to read all of this? Give them the answer to that question in the very first sentence or two. Now, emails can have a huge variety of lengths. Um, most conversational sharing informative emails, I, I go with the, the rule of three. Should usually have three points and that usually means three paragraphs. And if it's gonna be more than that, you need a reason. That's my point of view. Yeah, you can have many more than that. Some emails are very long because that's appropriate for their purpose. But if it is, make sure you're making a proactive decision as to why is this more than three points and why is this more than three, uh, three paragraphs. And if it is three points, don't put them into one paragraph, break them up. In fact, anytime you write anything, the rule is one paragraph makes a point. So don't put two points in the same paragraph. Threads, we've talked about threads. I won't revisit it. I've talked about this last week, actually, in the Q&A stuff we talked about, right? When you put somebody in the two field, that is the simulated equivalent of dropping it on their desk. It's not the only thing on their desk. I don't know if it's anything like my desk. It's got a lot of things on it. But if you CC them, that is the equivalent of walking into their office and just popping it in their filing cabinet. Doesn't even go on their desk. It's, it's there. They know it's there. They watched you do it. They saw it come in and go into their filing cabinet and they'll go and look at it if they have a reason. And if not, they won't. That, that's the mental equivalent of these two things. BCC, I haven't even mentioned here. I would really, really cautious about BCC. I, I just, as a rule, I just never do it. Unless I'm required to do it as some sort of compliance requirement, legal stuff, whatever. Otherwise, I just don't do it. That's my policy. Uh, if you need to copy someone without the original recipients knowing about that message in that way, send it and then forward it. Take it, go into your send items, grab that message, forward it and saying, hey, so-and-so, here's the message that I've sent to this other person. I'm forwarding this to you for your information because I believe you need to know about it. That may be entirely appropriate, but it's very different from blind copy. Blind copy is very much the case of I'm whispering behind your back. Where did it come from? Where did blind copy come from? Yeah. Why, why is it question. a thing? Why, why does it exist? I'm not sure, actually. Does anyone know? Chuck it in the chat. Yeah. So tell us if anyone, if anyone, uh, and if, and if anyone doesn't know and wants to know. Uh, make it up. Do we make... <laughs> <laughs> That's not what I was going to suggest, guy. <laughs> I was going to suggest ask the interwebs <laughs> because someone, the Google will know. Because someone else will have made it up for us. <laughs> um, Local government. Someone's saying local government. Yeah, BCC. I, I'm not too sure. Look, I, I, it's been around for as long as I can remember, uh, which is you know a few decades now in, in emails. But um, uh, it, it is a politically dangerous thing to do, and generally you don't need to. That's my advice. Uh, and I've already mentioned this call to action. Uh, let's see if anyone has any questions about email before we have a little bit of a chat about desktop uh, oh, stuff. Yes. We've got anything coming through? Go. Yeah, of course. Uh, I'll maybe just choose a quick three. Uh, Anne talks about automating responses by email. Um, is, is it ever justified? Uh, how to do it properly? Um, are there good timeframes to do it? Uh, so I'm, I'm wondering if that's other than the out of office reply. Uh, I mean, the, the, the automated response where it's in lieu of a response, where you're not able to, not going to, can't get to it, that's different. And, and most people, I think the etiquette is that if you get an automatic reply because the other person can't reply, that's kind of acceptable. But if you're talking about uh, an automated response, then 
it means that that person becomes aware that they have fit into a set of filters that you've defined. So the etiquette angle that you need to be aware of is that what you're doing is you're pigeonholing that section or that person or that group of people and the way in which they communicate. So that's that pigeonholing, that stereotyping, that categorization is a depersonalization of the interaction between two people. And if you have an understanding that that's an efficiency tool that you need to leverage and that you help the other person understand that it is not meant as a depersonalization tool. It's meant as an efficiency communication tool and you help them understand that, get them to understand that, then you can do it possibly without much damage. But without that uh, contextual understanding, need to be aware that that's what it's doing. It is uh, standardizing, systemizing, which ultimately means depersonalizing that interaction. So solve that and you'll solve the other problem. Thanks. Uh, got a couple of good chat responses to what BCC is about. Uh, Kerry says BCC means uh, it comes from the old days of typed and carbon copies. It means blind carbon copy. And then yep. Tan makes a good point of BCC is useful in distribution lists where you don't want others to see, others' email addresses to be seen. Uh, yes, uh, that's a good point. I, I neglected to mention that. Obviously, obviously, that's a case when you absolutely must use BCC. And huge faux pas if you don't, because uh, you're sharing everybody's email address that shouldn't see it. Uh, so absolutely in, in that situation. And, and yes, sorry, I'm this, uh, I, the blind copy, blind carbon copy is the origin of the acronym. But I was thinking of the question of where did it, where was it first originally meant as a mechanism within email? Uh, I have a feeling it actually existed way back even before the internet when email was just a thing between universities. Uh, and I think it even existed then, but that's a history lesson that I'm not clear on. <laughs> cool. We'll go back to questions. Jasper asks, do you think that programs like Microsoft Teams will replace email for distributing news and documents within a company? Look, I think uh, systems like Teams uh, have the potential to replace email in the sense that there are more advanced and more complete toolkit. So Teams creates integration that lets you integrate with uh, calendars, it lets you integrate with uh, email, it lets you integrate with documents, it lets you integrate with all sorts of other things. And it's, it's one of the things that does that. So we're going to see the uh, blurring of the boundaries. Right now we have a bunch of tools. We have an email tool, you have a chat tool, you have a this tool, you have a that tool, and they're all different tools. We will see them condensed and ultimately you'll have single platform comms tools that'll be a bit of everything. So if that's what you mean, then I would say, yes, that is where we're heading, but it's just due to the consolidation as the bigger organizations create richer platforms that do all things together. Hmm. And then we get into interesting questions about why you'd use one over the other. Yeah. Uh, maybe one last question. What do you think of using WhatsApp group as one of the communication channels among staff? It might be a good introduction to, to other forms of, Let's, let's talk about that here because that, that helps segue nicely into the next part of this conversation. I'm going to talk about uh, desktop driven chat systems. And uh, the short answer to that question is that uh, it is an effective, a potentially effective tool at enabling people to share group style information. But WhatsApp is just an example of a tool. I'm going to talk a bit more about the functionality rather than the product because a whole bunch of things can potentially do that. So when we talk about desktop driven chat systems, I'm talking about the stuff that doesn't only run on your phone. So I'm not, I mean, yes, you can now include WhatsApp in that because you have WhatsApp web, but that's not necessarily just it. I use a few, I, I use Slack. Uh, I use a, a couple of other tools that are chat systems that I use at my desk. Now I can log into them with my phone, I don't tend to do that very much with those ones because I use them at my desk when I'm interacting with colleagues and that's where it's, that's where it lives. And that's the job that it does. It enables me to communicate with colleagues, but I do it on a keyboard. And that means that as an etiquette, there's the expectation that I'm going to be able to type sentences or, or at least put words together that make grammatical sense. I'm not typing with my thumbs. So I don't have the excuse of, 
you know, using acronyms and, uh, and leech speak. So in these sorts of systems, we have a professional communications environment that still gets to enjoy full professional language. But they're also interruptive. Like I'm here conducting the webinar and I'm obviously busy, but someone could message me. I mean, clearly I would ignore it right now. But if I wasn't in the middle of a webinar, I might not ignore it. I might respond to it. I might look at it. I might, I might even engage in the conversation. But if they use that to trigger something and it's a quick sharing of understanding, a quick sharing of information or a trigger for something else, then maybe it's sufficient. But it can become very inefficient. So this is another example. We talked about email, what it's good for, what it's not. These sort of systems can be very good at the stuff that is leveraged by being immediate, but it can be very bad at the things that require many points of interaction because it's a time consuming way to have a conversation. So when you get into this dynamic conversation and you're chatting back and forwards, if it's immediately happening one after chat after the other, at some point, if we want to be efficient communicators, we should ask ourselves, should I push call? Should I call this person? So I say, hey, can I call you? Can you call me? Can we discuss this? That goes back to Simon's quote that we had here, where it says, we have to be clever about how we use these tools. We can't blame the tool if we're not using it to its best advantage. So often these systems are good at triggering another communication. Like maybe, hey, I sent you an email. You probably haven't looked at it yet, but uh, it's got some details. It is really urgent for me. I'm hoping you can have a look at it. Can you let me know when you'll be able to look at that? Now, that's a message that you might send via chat. The other person will say, could say tomorrow, today. All right, I'll look at it now. So you haven't written out the email in text chat, but you've used it as a way of conveying one little piece of information, which is your sense of timing priority. You've passed that on. And then at that point, you can step back. Now, if the person says, no, I haven't read your email, what's it about? Just tell me. At that point, we should be saying, well, it's not something that's best done on chat. Can I call you? Can you look at the email and then I'll call you? So by being proactive at how we manage it, it's a way of us using the tool in the most efficient manner. Because if we don't, all those pains, all those annoyances we get are often because we've used it in an inefficient way. But these systems are great for what was asked before when you get a number of people sharing a, a, a contextual understanding. Uh, years ago, uh, years ago, 10, 12, 12 years ago, I was doing some consulting work. I was hot desking in some client's office and you know, I was sitting there and I was surrounded by 20 odd people. And all of a sudden, 18 of them just got up and headed for the door. And they literally walked together and just started having a conversation that they'd been having for the last 10 minutes. And that conversation is where they're going to go for lunch. And it was, it was spooky because I had no idea that this was going on and it was like synchronized lunching and everyone just got up and did it. But, and yes, maybe that's a small esoteric example of how that could work. And we all know that it can work for much more work related outcomes, but it can be very powerful in the same way that a meeting can be very powerful. Remember those things we used to have? Remember those, that stuff we used to get in a boardroom somewhere and we all sort of, you know, come and bring our laptops and our papers and stuff. And remember those? Well, they were good for some things and they were terrible for others. Exactly the same. The problem isn't the tool. The problem is the humans in it. So we need to use the tools like these tools in a way that's going to give us the right results. So if we're using chat systems professionally. We need to be aware that it's not texting. It's not just a social version of let's send a text. We need to be articulate. We need to be careful, considered. We might need to be adopting certain professional etiquettes and being aware of them. Every message, and let's be clear about this. A message is not one line of text that you press send. That's, that's not a message in the chat environment. The message is the accumulation of several things. Now, one of the etiquette points that I'll, I'll, I want to draw upon when talking about the message 
We've all had those things where you're busy working, you're doing something and somebody will message you and they'll say, hi, how are you? Now, if this is a person that you haven't heard from in a while, you might think, oh, that's nice. They, they want to know how I am. If this is a person you talk to every day, you'll think, what do they want now? So as a point of the message and its purpose, you might double up and say, hi, how are you? Have you got time to discuss X, Y, Z? And you've done the polite thing. Go back to how we engage politeness in person. You walk up to someone, hey, how are you going? Oh, good, thanks. We put that into our conversation without any thought, without, it's so automatic, it's so deeply ingrained, we just skip straight on to, and then we have the next, and we don't even notice it. We might notice it if it's missing, but we don't notice it when it's there. We can do the same thing with instant chat. It's pretty good at giving some intellectual vectors, as long as it's brief. And it's good at motivating people because it's interruptive. It's like, oh, dear, Brenton's messaging me. Yeah, he sent me an email earlier this morning. I haven't read that yet. He's probably going to be, I better read the email before I reply to him because he's going to ask me about it. So it can be a good motivational trigger. But because it's not good at emotional vector change, we need to be careful of trying to make it do that job. Be wary of things like over exclamation, exaggerating, drama, things like that. Be wary of that because it can carry too far. It's also something that if it's part of the corporate work company system, then it might be on official record. It might be something that gets recorded and gets kept. So assume that it is. Marilyn Vossamant, incredibly intelligent woman. Um, way back, back when uh, Guinness Book of Records had such things as highest IQ, she was on that for a while. She's incredibly intelligent. She's written a number of books about being clever. And one of her points is that we all live in our own little world. Everybody's mind is its own unique existence. And this makes communicating a work of art. Literally, it's, we artistically compose every single message we try to send to someone else, which is at odds with the fact that firstly, we have professional outcomes that are usually measurable by KPIs. And secondly, all these tools, which are some are good at one thing and some are good at something else. And it all gets a little bit crazy sometimes. What an amazing name for a clever person. Indeed. <laughs> What came, did did that come yeah. first, or like? Well, I I I don't know, but I assume that 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 was her birth name, I, I, or or perhaps perhaps it's her married name, perhaps it's her birth name, perhaps it's her maiden name. I honestly don't know enough about her to answer that question. Well, it's good fun anyway. But I'm I would agree it's a descriptor as well. She is definitely that clever. So instant messaging. Now I'm talking about moving a step beyond the desktop chat. I'm talking about the hand phone, the mobile devices, the instant messaging that you usually do with your thumbs. It's symbolic in nature. It's highly abbreviated. We, I mean, we know what the autocorrect does to us sometimes. The autocorrect is the technology's vain attempt to try to actually make us use words. So we know that there's a lot of symbolism. We know that there's a lot of abbreviations. There's an acronyms. There's all that stuff going on and it's happening because the system as humans, we want the, the best of both worlds. We want to make it so incredibly quick and easy and simple. And yet we want it to be rich with meaning. It's not, it won't be, it can't be. It can be very good at something very specific and we need to be very guarded and very careful about what those things are and don't ask it to do things that it's never meant to do. Instant messaging, because we're talking about a personal device often gets into the areas of individual attitudes. Some people have a different opinion as to what they should be doing on or with their personal device at certain hours of the day or certain topics that don't belong on it. There will, they will have attitudes and those attitudes can be culturally driven for all sorts of cultures that can impact the habits that they create and the habits that others expect as well. Now, if we're trying to get a colleague to have a motivational outcome, we need to be a little bit mindful as to what their particular attitude 
is regarding instant messaging. Should we message them at this time? Should we message them about this? It can invade personal space and sometimes that's a good thing and sometimes it's not. I'm sure all of us have experienced a bit of both sides of that coin where it works both ways. But I have a, a, a guide. I wouldn't call it a rule, but I have a guide. If there's more than, if you get to five replies in a, in a row, then you probably should be calling before you send number six. Unless the number six is thanks, goodbye. Or, you know, unless you're done. If you're not done after five or, or maybe even before then sometimes, ask yourself really is, I mean, if you've got nothing better to do and they've got nothing better to do, and or you have got something better to do but you really don't want to do it yes there's exceptions but i'm talking about if the goal is efficient use of the communications tool so yeah if you have got something that you really should be doing but you're not you can create side channels of communications with these tools and systems uh, but we all know already that they can sometimes be good and sometimes not be good but instant messaging generally should be about a context. It's about a thing. It's about something. Let it be about something and only about that something. And then let that something govern what's in the message, how complicated and how literal it is and when to stop it. Um, before we jump in and talk about video calls, actually, maybe we'll still jump in. I've only got a couple of slides left. Actually, I'll do that, um, Guy, because I'm just being aware of the time. I've only got a few minutes left of their initial allotment. Let me go through this, yeah, and then we'll works. have the questions discussion in, in, in five minutes' time. How about we do that? Yep. So we're talking about video calls. I want to just draw out a handful of things. And we talked about how different digital mediums have things that we need to think differently about. And we need to. We need to lift our awareness of what it will and won't do and what it's good and, and not good at what's hard what's easy video calls have an artificial element because the reason we want to see that person is because we're looking for that emotional connectedness that only seeing them in face to face can create so we want to see that we want to see that and and have that interconnect but it's we know they're not really there it's artificial so when it's artificial, we need to make up for what's missing. It's also the most complicated form of digital medium that we can use. Now, I'm going to go through some of these in a moment, but some of you might have already noticed that I'm generally looking at the camera. So I'm engaging with you with, with eye contact, but I occasionally do this. And you've noticed that. That's me checking the questions, that's me checking the chat. And if I look down, I'm looking at my slides. And even though they might be relatively brief, each time I do that, some little part of your mind will feel it. You'll notice it. You might not worry about it. You may forgive me for doing it, but you'll still notice it. So the complicated part means that I need to control my behavior. I need to limit some of the stuff that I would normally otherwise do subconsciously. I need to get rid of the ums and ahs and, and we, I need to try to engage with the camera. Things that I would never need to think about if I was there in person. But it means that you can have the body language. You can have the visual cues that we would otherwise miss and that we really crave. That additional layer in the communications that we talked about last week. And therefore, it does bring us closer to the other person. It makes us feel more connected to them. So here's a few hot tips that... We all, and some of you will immediately think, oh yeah, I wish this, this, I wish my colleagues would do this. There is actually, uh, uh, this week's forum topic is about your pet peeve, your pet hate when it comes to digital communications. So some of you might recognize some of them here. Background check, be aware of what others see behind you. Now, I'm sure you've all noticed by now, I do not have the white screen behind me today. I did that deliberately. This is my office. This is my, this is my real world. Right, so this is where I work. I've chosen what you see behind me. It isn't random. Actually, what, actually the only random thing behind me is that's, that's really the only place in here where the couch can go, which is kind of handy. The color on the wall, 
the fact that there's a monitor there, the fact that there's a, a Buddha statue there in the, the, the teaching pose, right? The fact that there's, that, that's Athena, goddess of wisdom. There's some, you know, papers over here that, that suggest that I know a few things. There's, there's Einstein, right? So these are choices that I made. There's some books and you probably can't see what's in there, but there's books on education. There's books on business. You know, there's books that says, Hey, this, this is kind of tells a story about me. You don't need to go through all those details, but what you do have behind you, like, uh, did anyone notice what was Guy's background? Did anyone notice his particularly Venetian background? Anyone remember? What did Guy have at his back? Anyone know? Put it in the chat if you remember what Guy had. Maybe you don't know. Maybe you didn't sink in. Maybe and, you didn't and, and do you remember what I had last week, which was just bed sheets? <laughs> but yeah, last week was sheets. So, <laughs> Wendy had it. <laughs> right. Yeah, but, uh, it, it Barbara's got in. Venetian blind. Yeah. Blinds, yep. Notice the blinds, right? So let me ask you another question while I, I'm going to carry on. But in, in, in chat... What do you notice most about what's behind me? What jumped out at you? What did you, what, what did your eyes go? And the reason I'm asking this question is because you'll see the differences of what different people noticed and what different people spotted. So have a look at that and get an idea as to all the different things that different people are noticing <laughs> about the background. There's some, there's some fun stuff in the chat there, Brenton. Uh, the orange wall, the statues next to the TV, the, the certificates, the awards, the pretentious, <laughs> this is, this is great stuff. And, and so much variation, right? There's something, there's something back there for everybody. <laughs> We've got a poll. Should we, should we launch that now? Yeah, go ahead. Let's do that. I'm going to keep talking. Microphone, right? Mute. What's that? What did I didn't say? Mute mastery. I, I had a, I had a chat. I had a, a week or so ago, a long online chat with uh, some friends and one of my friends had a desktop microphone and he must have moved that microphone every three minutes. He'd slide it across the desk and he'd slide it over there. And I, maybe he was cleaning his desk. I don't know, but he also had his phone next to it. So every message he got went ding in my ear, right? And all of this. <laughs> and then he decided during the boring bits that he'd watch a video on his phone, which came through louder than the other person that was talking, right? Mute management, right? Absolute golden rule of being online. Know where your mute button is, ride it. Jump up and down on it as much as you need to. That brings us to microphone wrangling, right? So some microphones are omnidirectional, some microphones are not. If you've plugged the microphone in, you might have to ask that question. If you haven't plugged it in, you probably don't. It'll be omnidirectional. If you have uh, any kind of plug-in mic, most of them have some sort of direction to them. Be aware of that. Make sure you're in the right angle. If it's omnidirectional, know that everything will get picked up. If it's on a laptop, know that every physical contact with the laptop or even the desk will translate straight through into the microphone. Keystrokes in particular. Clackety, clackety, clack typing can be louder than you speaking in front of it. So be aware of what your microphone will and won't do. Camera angles, you want face on as best you can. Now this isn't, mine isn't perfect. Mine's actually a fraction too high because the, the position of the monitor means that it's uh, probably three or four centimeters higher than would be ideal. Uh, but if I have it directly in front, then I can't see my screen. But be aware of that. Lighting. Uh, two point lighting, three point lighting. I've got, uh, I've got two lights so that they come at me from either angle and don't create shadow. You don't need to bother with this. We'll talk a bit more about this next week when we talk about delivering webinars, which is a little thing that we'll cover next week. So I'll go into more of that detail next week. Staying on target is avoiding distractions. It's about things happen, but we don't want to be deliberately distracting. We don't want to be deliberately um, you know, yeah, people are talking. I'm going to go over here and do this. I'm going to talk to this other person that's just come in. Be aware of when we need to be paying attention and what impact does it have on another person when we're not? Because this is all part of our personal brand. It's all part of us. It's all us. So just because it's a digital medium doesn't mean that it's a veneer. It's not a pretend us that's out there. It's the real us. And everything that happens really reflects on us. It's really interesting, Brenton. Like, just 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 to go with the poll, we've, we'll, I'll share the results. 
Okay. What do we get? Fifty percent of people 50% are like, like your it. office background, which is to me super interesting because professional communications to me would be like, well, you just make it a blank slate so that people can focus on the message, right? Like, right. Um, and that's a thing. That's totally a thing. Uh, so I'm I'm competing with this to a, to a certain extent, right? So I, I have to compete with it, which means I, I have to go that little bit extra. I, I move around a little bit deliberately more than I would have with a white screen because I need to compete visually, you know? So I can compensate for that a little bit, uh, but also most of it back there is subtle. It's subconscious. You can't read it. You can't see but, it. Like there's nothing on that monitor. There's no fish tank that you've got to watch or something. No, but it says stuff about you, right? Like uh, it's been really interesting with COVID you know, because I've, I've spoken with you about this before, you know, what people choose to have in their background says so much. Yeah. You know, like, uh, overwhelmingly I see academics on, for example, the drum or some ABC things like, Oh, we've got so many books, you know, <laughs> we've got so many awards. We've got so many Buddhist statues. We've got whatever it is. It, it, like, is, is that part of what you are trying to communicate? Absolutely. There are YouTube channels devoted to dissecting and critiquing the backgrounds of people who present online, especially people who don't present for a living, even those who do. There are, there are literally YouTube channels and many of them just devoted to critiquing, reviewing the background. It's that important uh, to, you know, not to everyone, but it, it's, it's, a, it's definitely a thing. It's, it's every bit as important as what you might be wearing if you were standing in front of the person. Because what you wear, what you carry is a part of that. Let me close the poll. This is our last data slide. This is, this is just some key. And I, I won't talk through this because this is a recap of everything we've already talked through, but I'll, I'll leave it there for everyone to have a look at for a moment. And I think we've got another poll in a second, don't we, as a, as a wrap up before we do our questions. Yep. Um, so it's giving subliminal information about a person and it helps us fill that extra channel, right? So having all of that means that you can position me in a more complete way, whether it's good or bad, each of you will judge separately, but it's more complete and that's satisfying. That's, that's cr scratching that itch. That's filling in that gap. And it's, it's dealing with the curiosity. Now, when you first got in, when, when we first started, there would have been lots of looking around and what is that? It's a, but at some point that mental, would have, that mental energy would have simmered down and you would have been able to focus more on what I was saying. So I didn't give you the really heavy stuff right at the beginning. Not that you would normally anyway, but we had an hour. So I had plenty of time to let you soak in the view before I started to say things that I was hoping you to tune into more. So now that's just background stuff and most of you probably not even thinking about it. Although if I change something next week, you'll probably all notice. Maybe I'll do that on purpose. I'll give it a, <laughs> get everyone to say, what, what has he changed this week? What, I'm, what did I'm he still keen with? on the outfits. I wanted to change outfits every week into something stupid. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Super interesting, Benton. I don't know, which, which do you prefer as, as just someone who presents a lot and is, I would say, very good at it? I like this when it's a long conversation. I, I like it when it's, when it's a, a, a drawn out or when um, people are getting to know me. All right. So I guess this, the other question is, when do I put the screen up? Well, I put the screen up during uh, a lot of the normal regular webinars that I have with university courses, because a lot of people come to those. Uh, I will have a, a, the open in the first week or so, but then often I'll put the screen up because a lot of them are tired. It's the end of the day uh, and they're not necessarily wanting to put too much mental energy into it. You know, some of them don't even want to see me. They know what I look like. They just want to listen to it. So I will, I'll reduce the noise and because in some cases it becomes noise, but for the most part, I like to have it. Because it does make things more complete from my point of view. Interesting. Uh, see, I I just hate the webcam altogether, but I'm I'm practicing because I, I that's just a, a personal thing, uh, you know. It makes me, I, I'm conscious of it. 
Yeah. But so much of it is about, you know, what you can communicate to the person as opposed to how I'm feeling. If I can get over it, well, there we go. Yeah. And, and I think part of the point of the discussion we had tonight was to talk about what we take for granted or what we don't tend to think about very much. And to talk about the fact that our old habits aren't enough, we need to deliberately create some new ones when it comes to digital mediums. And we just don't, not going to get the same result if we go ahead as normal. Super interesting. Right. What questions have we got? Heaps. Uh, All right. I wonder we, if we, maybe... we something else before we go to the questions. Uh, we do. We have that last poll, um, which is going to be very interesting. And you were going to talk about CSU. Yeah. Um, so we'll, we'll start with the final poll. Um, in group digital calls and meetings, which of the following digital problems annoy you the most? In this one, you get multiple choice, which is nice. Oh, you can choose many. So this is also the topic of or one of the things that we would encourage people to, you might want to share on the forums for this week is your, your uh, pet annoyance, whatever it is that really gets on your nerves. It doesn't have to be one of these could be anything. Uh, obviously be respectful and, and make it anonymous, but uh, humorous stories are always appreciated. Uh, and uh, many of, many of us, many of you, many, many of us will find it kind of interesting to see what oh. other people find annoying. I certainly am. 70% not using mute when they should. See, for me, like when I put this poll in, I, I thought the only one that would come up a lot is people obviously not paying attention. That to me says, oh no, <laughs> first of all, I'm not very good at talking. And, and second, it, it, it's a sort of a mark of disrespect. Um, for me, that would be the only one. Um, but all of these other ones, I thought maybe it's forgivable. It's, it's something that people are still learning. Wow. Well. Yes, except the third of them have said that that's still not cool, right? Yeah, really interesting. Yeah, that's true. So this, this isn't, an, it's not an either or, it's a select any. So I, and, and what I find interesting is that the only one that does seem to be scoring quite low is, you know, camera issues. And I tried to put things in the forum here that were generally solvable. These are things that we can deal with if we make the effort. And so the thing that annoys us is really when people don't make the effort. And I suppose cameras is something that maybe on this list is one of the hardest things to fix uh, if, you're, if you're guilty of it. So mm. maybe people are a little bit more forgiving of that. Perhaps that's a factor. I'm not sure. Yeah. So like last week you said, um, if, if, if people don't receive the message, it's on the person trying to communicate the message as opposed to just not paying attention. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. So oh. it's, you know, I'll share that result uh, again. Yeah. 70% not using mute when they should, which, which can be quite upsetting. Um, so, so, and what I would say for everyone else, cause you know, everyone who ticked that, which is, you know, 69% of you, you're probably thinking, yeah, I, I, I use mute responsibly. I mean, I, I would say that about myself, uh, but do we do it universally? Do we do it consistently? Do we do it to the extent that maybe we should do, do we have our moments? where we're not too worried about it. And if we do, then we're guilty of being in that 70% where someone would say that about us. So this is, this is also about being more consistent with adhering to the things that annoy us and, and we know annoy us. So meeting our own standards. All right. Well, um, I'm thinking I might do a little bit of a CSU chat. We've got heaps of really good questions. So I'll try and whip through it as quickly as possible. So I'll, I'll try and hold your attention. And if uh, you all disappear, I'll know why. Um, okay. So I'll, I'll grab the screen off you, Brenton. Yep. And then I'll, I'll start a slideshow. And if you could talk me through it, I'm actually terrible at presenting on Zoom. I much prefer when other people do it. So we can see here, hopefully, a slide deck with a bunch of different Charles Sturt University campuses. Is that right? Yep, that's what I can see. Wonderful. All right, well, the good news is you don't have to go to any of these because COVID and we are very good at online education, hopefully, as you can see from Brenton. Um, so uh, this is my artist impression of what this is. This is a photo from Hannah, by the way. Uh, I, I quite enjoy it. You can do it all online. That's the point. Um, doesn't matter where you are, when you are, and we can work around your other uh, commitments. That's, that's the key. 
So um, I didn't get many questions throughout the, or the webinar about what anyone would particularly like me to talk about. So I'll just go through the usual one. If, if you see anything, uh, Brenton or Hannah, feel free to chime in and interrupt me and say, can you answer this specific question? But basically, um, these short courses are meant to be a bit of a taster into what's, what you can expect from studying with IT Masters in Charles Sturt University. This short course, for example, relates to the subject professional communications, which is a part of many of our postgrad courses in, in IT and management and project management. We think it's a really important skill across all of these different disciplines. Uh, IT Master started in about 2000, 2003, somewhere around there, um, from Martin Hale, someone who you might remember from a lot of EDMs <laughs> uh, with lots of long-winded messages, which probably uh, go against the messages that Brendan is trying to impart to you. Um, but, but it seems to be working. We, we seem to be doing okay with distance education uh, and particularly in IT and postgraduate domestic, we, we do quite well. And these are some relatively old statistics, but they're, they're still going uh, and, and, and continuing to uh, obtain, they obtain. Uh, entry requirements. Actually, I'll be really interested, Brenton, if you can maybe give some critical feedback. This is, this is a good, you know, what not to do or, or the bits of the good or the bits of the bad, the bits of the authentic um, at the end of this little preso. Um, if you, if you are wondering about uh, postgraduate education, um, we do have entry requirements, but they're not, they're not as uh, onerous as you might think. Um, for the master's, to, for direct entry to the master's degree, we, we expect that people will have a bachelor's degree or higher. Uh, if, you, if you are coming in without sort of university experience, uh, then you can enter via the graduate certificate pathway. The graduate certificate is merely the first four subjects of the masters. They, they fit within a sort of a nested set of subjects. So professional IT experience for a graduate certificate, typically two years, but we can be flexible if, you, if you're showing a real keenness to learn or, or have a private experience. You know, so a lot of IT people we talk to, you know, they've been hacking since they were kids, so they just don't work in it. Um, we can we can let you in and we can work out study plans and these short courses can be really useful um, in, in making it possible. Um, so, so if you are keen but are worried about your eligibility, you can just jump on to our website and then you can go for, um, go through an assessment. It'll be personalised to to your situation, your course objectives, what it is um, you want to do. Um, and you can follow those links there, and we'll we'll add these slides at the end of the, um, you know, as as part of the resources of this short course. So yeah, the graduate certificate is the first four subjects of the masters, as you can see here, and and the advantage of doing a graduate certificate is you actually get a 10% uh, discount. Um, oh, and I haven't even started my video, so I'm so out of out of the, uh, the practice. Um, yeah, so the graduate certificate is, is part of the, the masters. You can start with those ones, you can tailor the program if you're looking at, particularly for those that are interested in, I think, uh, career changes or sort of transitioning from one area of, of IT or management to another, um, it'll be really useful. You can sort of get the piece of paper on, on the CV. Um, you can even put it on there whilst you're, whilst you're studying um, just to, to prove that you're, you're keen regardless. And, and then sort of continue on, chip away at the rest of the masters as you consolidate the knowledge that you gained and, and maybe work towards some industry certifications to earn credit towards the, the rest of the masters. So the, the grad cert and the grad diploma fit sort of between the undergrad and the masters. Um, it, it's a fairly common pathway now, I think. Um, it'll be something that you're all aware of or, or, or can easily become informed of about. Um, the grad cert, four subjects, the grad diploma, eight subjects, the master's, 12 subjects, all at postgraduate level, um, according to the uh, qualification framework that we use here. Time commitment, we try and keep it as flexible as possible. Um, six sessions per year, 
um, as you can see here, Jan, Feb, May, July, August, November. Uh, basically, whenever is good for you, we, we try and we say you, you're welcome to start. About 10 hours of study per week. Um, and that really depends on, on the subject you're doing, your relevant experience, and how much you want to get out of the subject. Um, it is possible to sort of do less, but, but and, and we don't necessarily think you will be able to devote 10 hours every week, but we sort of say across the, the course or across the subject, I should say, uh, an average of 10 hours a week is, is, is sensible and, and something that uh, we expect just so that you can get as much out of it as possible and, and you can, you know, sort of focus more on assessments at important times of the session as opposed to, you know, maybe in the first week you wouldn't be putting 10, 10 hours in. It also depends on, on how you study and how you best learn. But the study loads are variable, as it says here, and, and you can get leaves of absence. And you, the important thing is to make sure, you know, that you're really comfortable that we're here to help. We want to make sure that it's a sustainable study plan for you, congruent with your study objectives. Um, and we want to make sure it's, it works for everyone. There's no point jamming people into study if, if it's not something that's sensible or reasonable or if it's going to freak people out, you know, in a, in a difficult time, for example, like, like COVID. What I do most of the time when I'm not, I'm seeing short courses and getting in the way of Brenton, um, uh, is credit assessments. So on top of an eligibility assessment as to, you know, whether you're actually eligible for the course, you may be eligible for some recognition of your prior learning or, or experience indeed. Um, if you've got previous postgraduate study in a relevant field, then that's fantastic. And we should be able to make fairly quick assessments as to, you know, whether there's enough of a content overlap to make it worth your while to, to sort of ask for. Um, and there's no point making you learn something twice. Uh, the other avenue is, or the other major avenue that I experience is um, industry certification, particularly in IT, but also in project management and management. Um, there's a lot of really reputable industry certifications that again, prove to us that you, you have got the, the knowledge that you need. There's no point teaching it twice. So we'll allow you to sort of have that subject as, as recognition and we'll, we'll, trend, we'll give you a credit for it. Examples might be if you're interested in, in management subjects sort of, or project management, maybe managing a lot of the Axelos certifications, Prince2, uh, PMI, PMP, uh, managing successful programs, they, can't, they spring to mind. Uh, a couple of the ones that I know Brenton has taught before about um, ISO 20,000 um, uh, and other sort of IT management frameworks, ITIL infrastructure library, um, really useful guidelines. If, if you have competencies in that, then, then again, there's no point making you learn it twice. We used not to give credit for work experience uh, or um, more accurately, it was really difficult for us to measure your proficiency. Um, but now we can award credit based on where you fit with it, within an ACS accreditation. They basically interview you and, and um, they talk about your old war stories for one of a better expression. Uh, and they will say, all right, well, you're con like, based on what you have told us, we put you at this level on our framework. And then according to where that goes, we can give you a certain number of credits, one or two, um, just according to where you fit on that framework. And of course, these short courses uh, are really useful. Not only are they hopefully really in like enjoyable and, and useful and a good networking experience and a, a time to get a free taste of postgraduate study with people like Brenton. Um, if you complete three of them, you know, do the exams and get the course certificate, you can also earn a recognition for the effort that you've made to do that. And you can get a credit there. There's a 50% uh, threshold on maximum um, on all of our postgraduate courses, but um, yeah, six credits out of 12 is, is not a bad, bad deal. So uh, next steps, uh, do your research. Um, we, we back ourselves as saying we're quite relevant and we, we try and make 
all of our courses um, really specific to the topics we're talking about. There's not a lot of patter. There's not a lot of filler, particularly um, in, in technological masters. I think there's a lot of subjects that can be so, a bit wishy-washy. We try and make sure that our subjects are not only reflecting the latest theory and, and uh, teaching students about the theory, but also about the application of the theory to the business setting. Uh, that I really think that that's the best way to teach for particularly technological courses. Um, we and, and we, of course, try and keep abreast as much as possible of the industry certification changes, um, whether it's whether it's IT or, or management. Um, and do your research about the the lecturers and the, the content. We go out of our way to try and source the best possible lecturers like Brenton, uh, who, you know, are clearly experts in the field and able to develop these courses and uh, subjects. Um, and we really think we're doing quite well. And, and I think the numbers uh, reflect that. If you're interested in maybe getting one of those assessments and, and sort of seeing, first of all, whether you are eligible into the course or, or at least looking for a, a pathway into the course um please do get in touch this is this is the stuff that i do most of the time it's uh, you, if you can go to our website itmasters.edu.au you can um, click the link to am i eligible and if you put in information about you know what your experience is, is we can sort of work out a, a really sustainable um course plan to to make sure you, you meet your objectives and my details are there uh so if you need any of them, you can, if you need to get in touch, please feel free. Um, there's a couple of other, couple more of us in the office who, who do this, um, th these assessments, or can answer any questions about, you know, your study and potential study and your plans and what's a good fit for you. So I might stop sharing my screen, Brenton, and then talk about how we can talk about this with respect to professional communications. Right. Should we tackle the questions? Sure. Am I too am I too big now on everybody's screen? Shall I put shall I reshare my screen? Yeah, chuck your chuck your slides up. And we'll just have the next week thing up again or something. Um, right. I'll just quickly check and see whether there are any questions. What, what about, questions have we got? That are the... uh, what time we got? So we've got one question about how long the masters runs. Uh, generally we say two years part-time if you're doing all of the subjects often students will get recognition of prior learning and that can cut down the time and cost associated with the masters and the rest seem mostly about your your topic which is nice and there's a lot of them 30 so well i'll do some uh whittling if you want to so sort of go through a few and Sure. Okay. Let me, uh, let me move that screen over to the middle. Uh, so I'm going to start with some of the easy ones that might be able to knock over first. I think we talked about uh, the WhatsApp group. So what do I think of using it? I think it can be a great tool very much. It's just about using the right tool in the right circumstances uh, and using something that the staff or the other colleagues are comfortable with or helping them become comfortable because they come to understand the way in which the tool is meant to achieve a purpose. And if you focus on the purpose, then you're going to have a better chance of getting adoption. Uh, let me go down a couple more. Uh, Jonathan's asking, can an email fully express the sender's actual message in which the receiver can emotionally get the impact of the message? I think I did mention that email is very good at the intellectual vector. Uh, it's less capable at the emotional vector. Uh, it can do it, but you need to use all of the tools of the written word. You need to do all of the uh, careful writing because the biggest problem with the emotional vector and the reason why I, I suggest that it's not good at it is because it can often go in the wrong direction. And you have all sorts of difficulties conveying the right kind of emotive triggers that will carry out the emotion at the other end. And especially if you have multiple recipients, they're all going to respond to something or to a piece of wording a little differently. So that makes it quite challenging as well. 
So asking an email to deliver an emotional change, it can do it, but you would need to do it very carefully. And that's the kind of email that you would spend quite a bit of time on it if that's what you needed it to do. Uh, Fazlul is saying 3.3 3 paragraphs. How long can that be? Uh, I believe in short and concise. Well, I, I would think of uh, the three W's. Uh, what, when, and why. If you cover those three, you're probably delivering a, an adequate email. So the three points that I would you'd start with is what's it about? When is it relevant? And why is it important at all? So, and that why is often, you know, why is it relevant to the sender? Not necessarily why should it matter to the recipient? Yes, you want it to matter to the recipient, but we don't necessarily want to tell them what they care about or tell them what they should care about if we're not actually in a position to do that. But if we tell them why we care about it, they may adopt that or they may take that into consideration. So those are the three things you'd start with. What's it about? Obviously, it has to have that. Uh, when is it relevant? Because without a time frame, it's you're not going to get a motivational outcome out of it because it's just going to disappear in maybe one day. And the why helps give a reason to make that thing what they will do instead of something else. Because most people have many things to do with their time and whatever we're needing them to do is going to compete with that. Uh, how to properly split a thread. Changing Is changing the subject line appropriate? I would say yes, but when I do it, if a thread has gone on and I'm replying and I'm changing a subject line, I put in little brackets the word edit or edited. So I let other recipients know that I've edited the or the, the subject line has been edited. Or I leave the original subject line intact and I put a hyphen or a colon or something and then I add something that's more contextually narrow or anchored at the end of it. Uh, but I'm not going to just wipe out the whole subject line and put a brand new one in there and hijack the thread. I'm going to evolve the subject line rather than simply change it. So thinking about it and think about it in terms of evolving it. Another question, is it good to say uh, farewell, God bless, end of an email, or is that sounding like a favor or asking indirectly? So phrases, sign-offs that you use in an email is mostly about etiquette. It's mostly about the last thing you would like that person to be thinking and feeling about you. So the only point I'd make with phrases like uh, God bless is that what you introduce is going to have a variable impact depending on certain members of your audience. Whenever you introduce a cultural phrase, or when I say cultural, I mean something that not everyone universally understands the same way, you introduce the potential for risk. Everyone understands what thanks means. Everyone understands what thanks and regards means. And you're going to have a pretty consistent reply. But with something like God bless, you've got the added religious element that you might have a very clear understanding of exactly what that means to you and where you draw the limit between a religious perspective and a professional perspective and where they blur and where they don't. And that's very clear for you as an author, but for a recipient, it might be different. And so every time you introduce cultural elements, you need to be mindful of whether or not your audience is going to have an unpredictable response they might see that you're blurring boundaries that they see differently to you. So when that is an issue, or if you see that it's a problem, you might not use that kind of sign off. But if it's people that you know would understand that, they understand you, they appreciate it, then you would use that. So that's, and it doesn't mean that it's specifically a religious component, it could be anything that has a, a, a culture element to it that's gonna be perceived differently by others. Roger's asking, is it acceptable to include other recipients in the to field of an email since CC will go to the filing cabinet, but the email is directed to only one of them. Okay. So as a rule, I would say avoid that because the risk you run is that the other people that are not really receiving it and it's not really meant for them, they'll stop reading all of your emails in the same way. That's the risk that, that you have. It's crying wolf they don't know which email is really meant for them or not until they open it and read it. 
And when they feel cheated that they really shouldn't have read it and you should have CC'd them, you lose trust, you lose credibility. Uh, you might do it on a very specific targeted occasion. I did one today, actually. And, I, and when I did it, I felt it. And I felt it as being, this is out of the ordinary. And I, I considered it and I thought, yes, it's something I will do now. I would do it a few times a year, if that. And so another way you can go about it is that you can forward the email later. Copy them and then, or forward the email and say, hey, uh, I was going to CC you on this or I did CC you on this, but I'd like you to just be more aware of it than that and, and, and note. Or you might instant message them and say, hey, I just copied you on something, but can you just have a read so you know it's there? Because it, it may really come up for you later, whatever it is. So there's other ways that you can do that other than eroding your trust in what they see from you. Anonymous says, uh, can you advise as a rational to keep the subject line without altering it in corporate setup? I think that's a similar question. I might, uh, multiple facets. So I think I've already talked about altering the subject line. And I do think that, yes, there's a case for doing that, but you evolve it, don't just alter it. Uh, with desktop instant messaging, they often come with a presence indicator, here, away, in a meeting, etc. Always set mine to away to allow me space to respond, etc. So what's my thoughts on that? So. Uh, you're probably doing that because of what you've experienced thus far. And maybe you're doing it because if you set yourself to available, you're going to get bombarded. And how you respond to that, uh, if you set it to a way that gives you the excuse of not responding. I would normally suggest that whether you're available or not, we all have the excuse or the, we all have a valid, I'm not going to respond to this message right now. There's no way that another person can know and expect that you are absolutely available. You might be on a call, you might be deep in thought of a writing something that you need to concentrate on. There are a hundred reasons why we're not going to drop everything and respond to that. So the message for all of you and all of us is when we send an instant message, don't expect an instant reply. Don't demand one. That's not how it works. If that's what you really need, put it in the message. If it's, that's not going to work, ring them, that old fashioned thing called a telephone. And even then they might not pick up. So that's what I think the etiquette should be. If you need to be away for defensive reasons, uh, and if you're always away, then they know you're just doing it because you don't want to set yourself to being there. So once they've decided that it's a tactic on your part, then they will use a tactic to get around that and they'll just message you anyway. So maybe some systems with a do not disturb means that you won't even notice the message. Maybe you should use that instead and say, well, if you, but then you have to use it on a more deliberate basis. So there's no simple answer to it. It's culture, it's etiquette. Uh, and if you have a small team of people that you're dealing with, maybe you can let them know, Hey, this is how I want to do this. If it's a larger team, then you're going to have to educate them slow and gradual like. Are people using face-to-face -face meetings less uh, pre-COVID uh, and other forms of more? Absolutely. Uh, I would definitely agree with that. People are using face-to-face -face meetings significantly less. If you're also asking the question of what's going to happen after everything goes back to normal, I absolutely believe that there will be a new normal. And a lot of the barriers, hurdles, obstacles, emotional, financial, operational, they've been overcome now, all in a rush. And once those barriers are broken down, people will be using digital mediums of communication a lot more than they used to pre COVID. Yes, there'll be, we'll go back to meeting and, and interacting face to face and all that sort of stuff. We'll probably even all go back to shaking hands, but there will be benefits from using digital tools that are really good at doing things because they're really cost effective and they're time effective and they're this and they're that. This is our apprenticeship. This is our chance to learn how to use these things really well. And as we do, a lot of these new methods will be here to stay, provided we keep using them in the right way. Uh, I'd like the panelists' views on simultaneous chat room whilst listening to a lecture. Great Can question. We, <laughs> we, have, we had an example of that tonight. So the views on simultaneous chat room whilst listening to the lecture can be distracting and interruptive, not paying attention to the topic at hand. 
absolutely true, but then it depends on the topic. If the topic being discussed is something that only some people present would be interested in at any point in time. Remember those, remember those old fashioned meetings we used to have when at any one time, half of us didn't need to be listening. We kind of needed to because it was too hard to fake it, but online we can fake it, right? So we have to understand that the mechanisms of human uh, paying attention is a return on investment thing. It's a value proposition. If I'm not getting the value, I'm not going to pay attention. So one of the things that we need to do is making sure that the audience there and the timing and, and when they're there needs to have a value proposition to it. And sometimes that means that if you've got five people in a virtual meeting and all five of them need to know stuff, let's do that first. And then maybe some of them can drop off, don't need to be there. When you're talking about something like this, that everyone's wanting to be there for a period of time, there's stuff that I've said that some of the audience already knows. They already get it. They totally understand it. You know, I'm just echoing stuff that they're already familiar with. Would it be a problem if they do something else at the same time? No, because they're giving an hour of their time or however long that they've given. So there's a return on investment respect that I have to give to them that says, well, maybe something else that's going on for them right now is actually important. And if it's not, and they're just bored with me, well, then that's, that really is on me as well. And I can't fault them for either of those. But if it's something that I really, the outcome that we are all large, then like I'm in an organization and I'm sharing something that the organization requires them to listen to, then it's different. That's when the outcome is bigger than both of us. And that's when it can be poor etiquette to be distracted, but you still get people chatting amongst themselves. You know, you get the, the sharing of people saying, Hey, you know, look at, listen to what the boss is saying. Has that happened to you? Like what's going on? And they'll chat to each other about it. You got to decide whether or not that's going to be helpful or not. Cause if you block it, then you separate people from each other. They're just going to go and do it later when maybe they should have been doing something else. So understanding the reasons for it and realize that quite often it's not, it's counterproductive to try and block it. And, and also the, the, the opposite side of the same coin, you know, people that might be not fully across what you're talking about and need a, a leg up quickly. Those people who are well-versed in what you're talking about can give them that help really quickly. And that's why we really employ that chat for the short courses. Yes. I mean, there's no way I could watch what's going on in the chat during, I'm, no. I'm busy, but all of you, you also get in this environment, you get the benefit of seeing that you're there with others. There's things of interest. There's things that other people are saying that are interesting. And I, I, I try to go at a pace that allows a little bit of that to, to sink in and allows that to be part of the experience. So remember I said at the beginning, the user experience, everything counts. The chat counts. So I have to give your head, your brain, a little bit of space to tune into that channel from time to time. Because might it's be good to yeah. Part of it might, might be, be good, good to what? jump straight to Chris's uh, question. Um, do you have any tricks to get over a short attention span? Uh, someone who might be drawn to the chat just for the procrastination side of things. Um, do you have any tricks to get someone over a short attention span? Which is a bit even someone <laughs> shiny. Yes. Look, I, I'm I'm guilty of that. Um, especially when I'm marking, <laughs> I, <laughs> like anything, anything that happens around me and it's like, Ooh, shiny. No, but that's, that's because you have to put certain mental effort. Um, probably the best, if you're talking about an internal discipline thing, what I do is I create blocks of time and I will deliberately say, right, for the next 30 minutes, I'm doing this no matter how painful it is. And I reward myself with something that I really would like to do at the end of that, whatever it is. And, and so we have to manage our ability. If we push ourselves through something that's horribly boring for too long, we'll stop absorbing it. We'll resent it. There'll be a heap of other things that come back to make that painful. So when you can do the thing in short bursts, allow interruptions, but just the same way that you, you cap the boring stuff, you cap the interruption, put a limit on that too. And maybe through that kind of system, you can feel comfortable about the fact that there's a bit of a quid pro quo going on within yourself. 
that's the method that I use. I think I'm hoping that I've answered the right question there. Uh, Jeanette, uh, does anyone agree that managers should be BC'd on email in order for the person to respond? Uh, Is that like the, the passive aggressive one where it's like you haven't responded? <laughs> Uh, so my, my simple answer, there's two sides to this. One is the politics of making a manager aware of somebody not doing something. Uh, that's a thing. That's totally a thing. People do that. And that's a problem that, that employees and, and colleagues need to deal with. But BC seeing it isn't the only way of dealing with that. So if, if that's a thing that you think you need to do on an ongoing basis, then that means that every single time you need someone to do something, you're using up their manager's time. Then a proactive and helpful way of resolving that would be to in communicate with that manager and saying, I feel the need to do this. And this is probably going to unfairly consume your time. And I'd like you to tell me, is there some other way that you'd like me to handle this? in order to get this person to do this, because I have goals, I have objectives, I have KPIs, I have things I need to do. And I'd like to work with you on solving this rather than using you as a weapon. Can we work something out? Now that would be the altruistic approach. That would be the, let's be mature about this and work this out. Not everyone's gonna to respond to that. And some managers are as much of the problem as anybody else. So, but the best answer is not to rely on the communications trickery to achieve the goals. If you've already done that and it hasn't worked or you know it won't or, or, or whatever, then forwarding it separately is an alternative to BCC. Uh, but if you BCC it, the recipient doesn't know that their boss knows. So you, you're not really using that as a encouragement upon them. You're using it as a trap for them to fall into. So you, you're really giving them enough rope to hang themselves. Now, in theory, that tactic should result in that note, that rope getting tight at some point. That's what it should be all about. At some point, there should be a backlash, which is meant to create long-term behavioral change. So be more proactive about the long-term behavioral change rather than relying upon the ongoing mechanism of BCC. Next question, three to go. Uh, would we ever see integrated communication? I think we answered that one. I think we answered that one. We will definitely see more and more. Uh, and yeah, saying, what, what's your perception of the future of bots as a way of answering questions online? Okay, great, great question, this one. Um, the simple answer is they're going to get more and more clever. Right now, the technology is such that you can at times figure it out. One thing I would say, and this is something in, in one of the subjects that I teach, which is uh, the digital social selling, which is online selling. I think it's important to be honest with customers and with others when you're talking to a bot, let them know. Uh, I think the uncanny valley problem can be a real setback and a detriment. It could be a, a, a backlash if they think they're talking to a human because the moment they need empathy, they won't necessarily get it from a bot. And if you've got a customer that wants empathy, thinks they're talking to a human and discovers they're not, then the consequences for them would probably be even worse. So just be honest, you're talking to a bot, I'm a bot, this is how it works. Uh, but absolutely, they will get better and better at it. And they'll get better at doing things that bots should be doing, but there's a limit. Don't ask a bot, don't program a bot to be emp empathic towards your customers. That isn't going to work. Amazing. Thanks so much, Brent. I think we've answered all of the other ones. Any that we got Excellent. rid of? Uh, I. I just sort of had to cut them off and I'm sorry for that as usual we've run over time um Chuck any further questions in the forum uh, thanks for hanging around much longer um and thanks Hannah for hanging around Brenton thank you again I look forward to next week group and team comms dynamic yes we're going to talk about all this sort of stuff as groups teams bunches of people and uh, see if we can find some some gold in all of that beauty thank you good all night. right Thanks. Good night.